Hello, everyone. How are you? Good? Good. You all made it today, right? Yeah. This is tremendous. Now, the fact that you made it today tells me quite a bit about all of you. There's a few people calling me up that was going to come. The word comes, we can't come. There's all these cars sliding on the road. So being here is a, is a great first step. Um, I work at the University of Maine at the Advanced Structures and Composite Center. I've been, been a faculty for over a quarter century uh, teaching here at UMaine. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about what we do in the lab and how you can get involved. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about the biggest project we're doing in the lab right now. It's the offshore wind project in Maine. This, this unit you see right here is a floating wind turbine. It floats. And it harnesses the wind off the coast of Maine. It's the first floating wind turbine off the US coast. It was built in our lab at the university by students and by staff and faculty and Chimbro. And we towed it down the Penobscot River last summer, and it now sits off the coast of Castine, Maine, and harnesses the very, very strong winds off the coast of Maine. And what's cool about it, it's made out of concrete. And people tell me, how can concrete float? Well, it does. How can it float? Okay. Uh, so the Advanced Structures and Composite Center has about 200 people who work in it. We have the largest structures and materials lab in the United States. And what we do is we, we, we work with companies across the country and the world to help develop better materials to build stuff. Okay, so if you want to build a, a, a bridge faster and cheaper, we work with you to try to figure out how to do that. If you want to build a boat faster and cheaper, we can tell you how to do that. If you want to build a wind turbine faster and cheaper, this is what we do. So we, we bring advanced materials into construction. Uh, 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 our laboratory uh, has um, uh, gotten the top industry awards over the last many years across the United States um, uh, for a variety of technologies. How many of you have heard of the bridge in a backpack? Okay, well, this was invented in our lab. And actually, some of our students have actually a part of the patents that we filed for this technology. And you know what the cool thing about all this is? We were told this will never work. We were told, don't even try, it will never work. Yeah. Do you know what Henry Ford said once? If you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right in both cases. What does that tell you? If you think you can, will you try? If you think you cannot, you'll never try. So you've already lost. So the first step of reaching your goals is you have to think that you can. And that's very powerful. You have to think that you can. So when they told us 10 years ago you couldn't do this, we didn't believe them. We spent day and night, students and faculty and staff worked all together and tried to figure out how to make a bridge that will fit in the back. In the back. And the way it works is these bridges are made with arches that are about a foot or two feet in diameter. And you can fit a 40 foot long bridge arch in a University of Maine hockey bag. Okay. And, and you, can, you can inflate these arches on the site and then you infuse them with the resin. Within, within a couple hours, they're stronger than steel. The tubes are stronger than steel. You place them about six feet apart, put a decking over and backfill with sand and pave the bridge. Okay, we did that and uh, we have a company now that's producing these bridges. It's been approved in all 50 states in the country and we're shipping bridges from Maine. We've shipped our first bridge overseas in, in, in a small shipping container and it got built in two, two, two weeks when it got there, okay, two weeks from, from beginning to end. Think about it. And this is not small bridges. These could be 50, 60, 70, 80 feet long. Okay. Uh, what you see down in the bottom is a boat for the U.S. Navy SEALs. How many of you like the Navy SEALs? I do too. I, just, I like to like them and I want them to like me too. So, <laughs> now, now the Navy SEALs, as you see down at the bottom, they have a boat called the Mark V. This is a boat that 83, that's 83 feet long, can go over 50 knots, but think what would happen. If you go in about 50 knots, you get four or five foot waves. The wave slamming forces on the boat hull were causing 10 to 20 Gs in the boat which means that they were getting shattered molars, the molars were breaking in the boat, and they were getting damaged bones in the back and in the legs, as tough as they are. Um, so we worked with the Office of Naval Research to redesign the boat. Now the boat's made out of aluminum. Think about a big aluminum can, 83 feet long, hurrying down 50 miles per hour and hitting four or five foot waves, and you're sitting on it. That's not good, right? So what we did is we, re we redesigned the hull using composite materials, using carbon fiber and Kevlar fiber and use what we call a sandwich construction. So you have a, a core uh, sandwich that's very lightweight with carbon on both sides and it acts like a shock absorber. So think about uh, how many of you would go out and take a run with, uh, with aluminum sole shoes. That would be a bad run, wouldn't it? 
but you'd like N Nike Air shoes would be a good thing, right? Okay, this is like a big Nike Air hull, right? So when it hits the, hits the, uh, the waves, it absorbs the, the impact of the waves in the hull itself. So we built it on time and on budget, delivered it to the Navy. The Navy SEAL tried to break it. They put about 1,500 pounds of steel in the back of it and, and hurried down at 50 miles per hour and, and nothing happened. They were very happy with, with, with this technology. So, so we're pleased and we continue to work with the Navy on other technologies. This is the bridge in a backpack, what it would look like. This is a very nice drawing. I couldn't afford it, but the New York Times liked it and they had a whole page full story on the bridge in a backpack developed at the University of Maine. So this is an example of, uh, of what it would look like. You could see here the, uh, the concrete footings, the arches uh, that, that are filled with concrete on site. This is the longest composite materials bridge in the world. We designed it at the University of Maine, developed the testing technologies, and were built here in Maine, 540 feet long. And these girders that you see, the gray girders supporting the bridge, are made with composite materials that are one-sixth the weight of steel and don't corrode. Isn't that cool? All right. And you can see in the upper left-hand corner, the, the, uh, uh, that was the, the bridge being tested in our lab. So let's talk about offshore wind. Um, this is your family's budget in 10-year increments. Each pie is your family's budget. 1998, 2008, 2012, again in 2018. Uh, what you see in blue are the energy costs for, your, for the main family, for your family. In yellow are the health care costs for your family. And in green is what's left to live on once you've paid your health care bills and your energy bills. Is it looking good as you go to the right? It's not looking good. So what's going on? What happens is when you were paying, you remember paying $4 a gallon in, uh, in 2012 for gasoline? You remember that? You remember paying $4 a gallon if you're, if you're for, for heating oil in the basement to, to fill up the tank in the basement. You remember doing that. Okay, when, you, when we pay $4 a gallon for gasoline and heating oil, about 20% of the family's budget goes to energy costs, 20%. 20% of your entire family budget. Now you might tell me, well, it doesn't make sense. Show me the numbers, they're not very hard to get at. Okay? How many of your families have two cars? Okay? You have two cars for your family. All right, how much do you spend for cars, to, to, for gasoline in your car? Uh, I usually have time to fill up my car on the weekends, so usually I fill up on the weekends, and I'm filling up 50 or 60 dollars to fill the tank. Does that make sense? Okay, 50 dollars, they call it 50 dollars times two cars, it's $100 a week. Times four is $400 a month. Times 12 is $4,800 a year. $5,000 a year just to fill the tank on the two cars. Okay. Uh, most of us in Maine, 70% of us in Maine use heating oil to heat our homes. How many in your home are heated, are home, are heated with heating oil? Okay. You'd like to get off of that if you can, but right? But $4 a gallon, how much heating oil does the family use? About 1,000 gallons a year. Okay, four, time, uh, four times a thousand is what? Four thousand, five plus four, we're at nine thousand dollars. Electricity is a thousand dollars a year. So the total is what? Ten thousand dollars a year for electricity, heating oil, and gasoline for the two cars. What's the average family budget in the state of Maine? Family budget. In the mid 40s. So 10, 10, divide, 10 divided by 40, you're, you're up, you're up near over 20%. 20 think about that. How many of you think that gasoline prices will not go up in the future. How many of you believe gasoline is an unlimited resource? And how many of you believe, you one believes it's an unlimited resource? Okay, good. And how many of you believe, how many of you believe it's okay to burn gasoline? What happens when you burn gasoline and heating oil? You put CO2 up in the atmosphere, right? And what, what does CO2 do to the atmosphere? It creates some very strange weather patterns, right? It heats up the earth, heats up the earth and, and, and then you, you uh, the young people, yourselves, you'll be dealing with that a lot more than our, and our, our generation will be. As you grow up, if we keep, we keep heating up the earth like we do, we're gonna have major, major storms, as we have been seeing. We're gonna have extreme storms. We're gonna heat up the earth. We're gonna have extreme droughts in different parts of the world. And the sea level rises will start to rise and we're gonna have all kinds of trouble, uh, like you've seen in New Jersey, uh, in, the, in the last hurricane. Does that make sense? So we've got to find ways to get around all that. So, so what we try to do is figure out what can we do in Maine, in many parts of the U.S., as a large energy resource to replace gasoline and heating oil. Uh, we, we discovered that offshore wind is one of our largest renewable resources in the state and one of the largest renewable resources in the United States. Question for you. How much do you think within 50 miles of the U.S. coast 
how much offshore wind is there? A lot? A little bit? A lot. Let me give you a number. There's enough offshore wind capacity to power the country four times over. There's enough offshore wind capacity to power the United States four times over. Is that a big resource? It's a big resource. I'm going to talk gigawatts. Off the coast of Maine, there's 156 gigawatts of offshore wind. What's a gigawatt? We all know gigabytes, right? Or gigabits. But what's a gigawatt? A gigawatt is 1,000 megawatts, which is a million right? uh, kilowatts. W what does that mean? A gigawatt is roughly a nuclear power plant. So one gigawatt equal what? One nuclear power plant. How many gigawatts does it take to power the whole state of Maine? 2.4 gigawatts. It takes 2.4 gigawatts to power the whole state of Maine. How much offshore wind do we have within 50 miles of our coast? 156 gigawatts. It takes 2 gigawatts to power the state of Maine. Is that a big resource? Do you think we should be trying to figure out a way to harness it? Do you think we should? Do we think we have all the answers? No, we don't. That's why we do research and development. How many people tell me every day that you're never going to get there? I hear it all the time. Do I listen to them? No, it just makes me work harder. It makes me mad. So I work harder. And we're going to get there faster. That's, what, well, that's what's going to happen. So we're trying to create a way to harness the, the wind off the coast of Maine to help power the state of Maine in the future. So we have a plan. In the next 20 years, we want to build 5 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. 5 gigawatts, which is roughly what? 5 nuclear power plants worth of wind when the wind blows. If we put 5 gigawatts of wind off the coast of Maine by 2030, there's enough energy to power every home in the state and to fill up every car in the, in the future. How many of you in the future think we'll buy an electric car? Okay. What if that electric car was powered by wind blown off the coast of Maine? Wouldn't that be cool? Then when you're driving down the highway at 70 miles per hour, now you can do it at 80 miles an hour in some places. I've seen people drive at 80 miles per hour past me. Uh, sometimes I'm the one passing. But, but, but if you're driving at 80 miles per hour, and now think about the wind is really what's driving you at this point in time. You're not importing fossil fuels. You're not put, uh, polluting the atmosphere. And that, that, those dollars, your energy dollars, stay here in Maine. I want to give you another statistic. At $4 a gallon, how much of our energy, how much of our dollars leave the state of Maine? to pay for gasoline and heating oil at $4 a gallon. Any idea? All of it. All of it, but yeah, $5 billion leave the state of Maine every year. $5 billion to pay for gasoline and heating oil at $4 a gallon. $5 billion. What's the whole state budget? Anyone knows? The budget they have to spend in Augusta on everything? Education, health care, roads, bridges, to fight each other down in Augusta. What do they do? $3 billion. Okay. And we send $5 billion every year away from the state of Maine in fossil fuel prices. And if gasoline prices go up by a buck, another billion dollars leave the state of Maine. Do we have any control over that? No, we don't. So do we try to harness offshore wind? That's what we're trying to do. So what we try to do is, is walk before you run, crawl before you walk. That's our 20-year clock. Uh, we, we started by building small-scale models of floating wind turbines. And, and last summer, we put in the first floating wind turbine. It's a one to eight scale prototype of the full size unit. By 2017, we're going to place two full size units and then start building farms in 2020. That's our plan. The key here is dropping the cost of offshore wind. It costs too much today. So we're going to drop the cost. So in the 2020s, we're going to be able to be more cost effective than fossil fuel generated electricity. So, how do we build offshore wind farms? This is Europe. Europe is the leader in building offshore wind farms. They built their first farm in 1991. How do they build wind farms? They, they have shallow water, so they drive these huge piles into the seabed. Okay? This is a pile that's 20 feet in diameter. Think about 20 feet in diameter, being driven using this big impact hammer. This is the biggest hammer you've ever seen that's going to drive it into the seabed, into the mud, 40 or 50 or 60 or 80 feet. That's the bottom of the sea. You drive it into the seabed. Then this is the water level. Then you attach a tower, then, then the turbine and the blades. You use these huge pieces of equipment called jack-up barges. You see them on the left-hand corner. It costs you two to three hundred thousand dollars a day to do that, just to rent those barges. Okay? Do you think that's it? That's cheap? No, it isn't cheap. Now they're paying twice as much as land-based wind. So what do we try to do is, we think we, we have a better solution. We're going to prefabricate these floating turbines, these turbines, not fixed base, but floating turbines, dockside, and tow them out to sea. And uh, this is a shot of the first floating turbine built in the US. It was built in our lab. It was deployed last May uh, on, in the Penobscot River. 
towed down the Penobscot River 30 miles. That's a tow-out operation. And um, we got to Castine. Now I'm going to have to ask my uh, friends down there to turn. This is when we were towing it down. Uh, that was uh, on June 2nd. And you could see the boat, uh, the trailing boat behind it, shaking around. And the turbine is fairly what? Stable. Stable. That's what we want, right? That's what we designed it to be. This is made out of concrete. The tower, the yellow tower, is composite materials. Everything in yellow uh, from the water level down is all concrete. Okay? And, and uh, you can see here, we towed it down as a tugboat. It's the main Maritime Academy tugboat. And when we got there, we had pre-installed mooring lines, like you have on a boat, three mooring lines. And we attached them to the unit. We have an undersea cable that, we, uh, that uh, brings the power back to shore. It just lays on the seabed from the unit to the seabed and brings it back to shore. So, so this is the unit installed in Castine. Notice the name there is called Volturnus. Guess who came up with a name for that? One of the students who works in the lab. We asked the students to come up with a name for this technology. And one student said Volturnus because it has the word volt in it. It has the word turn because it turns. It has the word, the letters US because it was invented here in the US. And Volturnus all put together is the Roman god of the easterly winds. Now that had to win, right? Okay. <laughs> That's a good name. Uh, so this is the Volturnus and it saw uh, on November 1st, you remember when we lost power in the state of Maine? It was really rough out there. It saw the equivalent of a storm that's more than 100 years. Look at that unit and look at the size of the waves coming in at it. Uh, this is a video from shore. We have a camera on shore looking at that unit. That unit has over 50 sensors in it. It, tells every, it knows everything that's happening to it. It's a smart unit. Uh, and uh, and the, the, the waves are coming at it, and you'll see in just a minute, are equivalent to more than 100 year waves. Look at that size of the wave coming at it. Is it moving much? No, this happens to be close to 100-year storms. People tell me, how is it going to survive the perfect storm, the 100-year storm or plus? Well, we, we've proven that it does. And uh, in this case, this is a 1 to 8 scale. So the wave height was close to 8 feet. You could see that from, from trough to peak. Uh, it moved at most 5.9 degrees off axis. The equivalent, uh, the size of a person on a real unit, you can see it right there, is right there. That's how big that unit would be. Um, and, and, um, and this gives you the size of the waves. We saw a 70-foot equivalent wave on that day for that 1 to 8 scale unit, which is more than Hurricane Sandy, which is 32 and a half foot waves, and between a 100 and a 500 year wave in the state of Maine. Isn't that cool? It saw that and it survived very well, moved only 5.9 degrees in that event. Uh, so you could see it here, and um, the maximum...